Take our Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, I'm, I think we're doing great. We've only uh, had three messages and we're already in chapter 3, so that's not bad. So um, I would have thought for sure I'd take a longer. But um, I don't think I'll get all the way through chapter 3 tonight, though. Um, this has got some very valuable stuff for us as uh, children of God, as those who are uh, called. Um, that are a part of the church, that are set apart, that are, uh, are, we're supposed to be about serving our Savior. And so this has got some really good stuff for us tonight. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and we'll get into it, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you uh, for your word. Lord, I thank you for the amazing grace we've talked about. Lord, I thank you. Lord, we sung Cornerstone tonight, God. And Lord, uh, you are the foundation that we're to build on. We're going to talk about these things tonight, God. Uh, uh, Lord, that you are what our life is to be built on. Lord, there's no other foundation that that can be laid in Jesus Christ. And so, God, I, I pray as we look at these things tonight, Lord, you'd speak to our hearts. Uh, Lord, God, I pray you'd help me to be clear, concise, yet thorough, Lord. And, uh, Lord, uh, if someone has questions, Lord, go ahead and ask them, Lord. Uh, let's, let's study this together. And uh, I pray, God, that you'd just be in it. Uh, Lord, I'm blessed, God. And I ask these things that I might give you the praise and the glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. So, verse 1, he starts out, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Now, if you remember in chapter 2, Paul told them that, uh, that what things needed to be dealt with were spiritually discerned. Um, Paul wasn't calling them to talk about their jobs. He wasn't calling them to talk about their family lives or, or uh, what was going on in their neighborhood or what politics was going on in the day. He was talking about spiritually discerned things, things that the child of God should be aware of in their life. And so uh, in chapter 2, he talked about those. So then he gets into this, and he says, uh, uh, you know, that, 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 spiritual thing, that means when we're spiritually discerning things, it means that the Holy Spirit, coupled with the Word of God, instructs, convicts, corrects, and directs the child of God. You do understand that his Spirit and his Word, that's what it's supposed to do in our life. In my life, in your life, it is there, so it will instruct us, convict us, correct us, and direct us. And uh, always pointing us to Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He points us to truth. And we studied that in John. Now Paul lets them know that something has to change. Something has to change. Listen, folks, if you think that nothing has to change in your life, you are incorrect. Something should always be changing in our life. We should always be compromising who we are for the glory of God. Giving up ourselves more and more each day as the living sacrifice that we're supposed to be for the glory of God. And so we should always be maturing. And that was the problem. He says this in verse 2, And I have fed you with milk, not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. Brother, I like the podium at this height. I don't have to use my glasses at all. It's the perfect height. I can see everything just fine. This is good. So something good about short people. The podium is good for blind people. So anyways. He says, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. Now Paul, I mean, you might think, well, man, that was just rude. I mean, he just called a bunch of babies. Yeah, he did. But really, he was saying it in a very pleasant way to let the church deal with a hard truth. To be spiritually mature is to have a very shallow walk with Christ. That's what he's talking about. To have a very shallow walk with Christ. Um, I've got... Three grandchildren. I love having three grandchildren. I hope to have more. Um, I'm not rushing my children, but I love having... I figure if three is good, four must be better, right? I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that it has to be true. Um, but I, two of them are... They're, they're, well, one of them is, is three, and the other one will almost be three uh, here in September. She's on her way to being three. Now, they are past just having milk. Um, but they are very immature, um, they argue constantly, um, just for the sake, I think my grandson, his automatic response to no matter what you say is no, okay? 
Now, maybe that's because that's what he hears all the time. No, no, no. Okay, I don't know. But whatever it is you ask him, hey, would you like some candy? No. Oh, wait, yes. He always says no. He's argu- very argumentative. I think, I think he gets it from his father, but that's just my opinion. But uh, you can tell Josh I said that. But Josh is somewhat argumentative. But uh, Ezra, uh, he loves to say no. And Isla, Isla, she just likes to push boundaries and see you know, what she can get away with, I think. I don't know. But they're very immature. Um, they have not learned uh, social constructs so much. Now, I will say this. Let me tell you something. If one of them gets in trouble, the other one defends them, even though they could be getting in trouble for hitting them. Ezra can hit Isla, and I'm going to, Ezra, time out. And Isla goes, no, he's my friend. You can't put him in time out. Okay, and which is just weird. But, you know, that, there's some things they're learning that family is important, and that you stick up for each other. But there's so many things that they don't know yet. They're so very immature. And then we've got Addie. Now, Addie is just now getting to where she'll eat something besides milk. But she's not even five months old, right? She's almost five. She's five months. Okay, she's five months old. But, man, she likes potatoes. She does. She likes mashed up french fries, mashed potatoes. She likes potatoes. She likes food. But she's still not ready for meat. I can't, I can't give her steak. I, I don't even think we give Ezra and Isla steak, really, unless it's really, really small pieces. They're not ready for those things. They're not ready to, the, the, what, what could happen is they could hurt them. They're not physically able to consume everything that an adult would consume. And so Paul is letting them know, you are spiritually immature. You cannot consume the spiritual things. The reason you're struggling, the reason there are divisions, the reason that you guys are all arguing with each other all the time is because you're spiritually immature. Your walk with Christ is so shallow, the only thing you see is you. All, everything is surface level. He said, you like being a Christian, but not living like one. That's another sign of spiritual maturity. You love to say, hey, I'm a Christian. Yes, I, I trust in Jesus for my salvation, but we don't trust him for our everyday life. So Paul lets them know that they are fleshly. This is what he lets them know in verse 3. For ye are yet carnal. I mean, kinda, he's kind of being really nice. You know, you, I, I want to feed you meat, but I can't. You can only handle milk because you're very immature. And you're immature because you're very carnal. I mean, just lay it on him right here. This is, this is a heavy blow here. He says, you're nothing but flesh. You, you're only Christian in name. You're not Christian in your walk. Now, carnal means that your life is about you, not Jesus or others. That's what a carnal Christian is someone whose life is about themselves. The only focus they have is them. There's only one mirror they have, and the only reflection they see is them. There's no Christ. They don't worry about others. And if you've ever had a toddler or, you know, toddlers can be very, very selfish. Um, very, very selfish. And now the problem with that is they want what you have. They want what they have. They don't want you to have what they have. And if you have what they want, they're going to take it in any chance they get. Or throw a fit if they don't have it. Why? They're immature. They, they want what they want. They don't know how to get what they want. They don't know to just go and ask. We've tried to convince our grandchildren because I mean, we have this bad habit, Jerry, that if we buy something for one of them, we buy the same thing for the other one. Why? So they don't fight. Or my wife's very good about teaching them to share. Now, I say my wife's very good at teaching them to share because that's something I'm still learning. I'm not a great sharer, okay? Um, I, I, I remember she's been teaching me since we started dating. It was one time we were at McDonald's when we were dating, and she reached across to grab one of my fries. I didn't mean to do it. What? Joey doesn't share food. <laughs> and I grabbed her hand and she looked at me like, what in the world is wrong with you? Uh, she still married me, so uh, it's her fault. But uh, sharing is, 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 is hard for some people. And it's definitely hard for immature uh, uh, toddlers. And uh, talking about Christians, it's hard for us to share our lives with others when we're spiritually mature. And by sharing, I'm talking about pouring ourselves into someone else, allowing ourselves to be consumed by others. Because that's who, really who Christ is. And we're here to be like Christ, right? And so Paul's talking to them. And he lets them know they're being very carnal. Jealous of the others. If you go back to chapter 1, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this in a second, the division was the fact that some were saying, well, you know, Apollos brought me to Christ. Well, no, Paul brought me to Christ. Or Peter brought me to Christ. No, I was won by Jesus himself. And each one being an accolade or, or, or something to give them some type of a status, which made them superior than someone else. Um, these things simply are not so. And Paul deals with that a little bit more as we get later into chapter 3 here. But they were jealous of others, uh, bickering with others over jealousy and such. 
Um, and no unity because when you can't have unity when you're all that matters. When you're the only one that you see, you can't have unity with others. Okay? And so uh, Paul's trying to help them see these things. And then he gets into it in verse 4. He says, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? He said, This is a fleshly view. Your, your view, especially, it's immature. It's not going to help you grow in, in maturity as a Christian. He says, Paul alluded to this uh, cause of divisions in chapter 1, but now he's going to explain what they are and why they're wrong in doing so as we get into uh, the next few verses here. And so he's playing, he says, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? Now, uh, he wasn't asked them because he wanted to know who he was, okay? He wasn't having an identity crisis. No, Paul was saying, I'm nobody. Apollos is nobody. He says, who are they but ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? Now, you know, uh, we've taken minister, the word minister. You're not doing a very good job of it. Okay. So, everybody turn off your electronic devices. Okay. Uh, is that Malachi? <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm sorry. Malachi sitting there going, ha ha, it wasn't me this time, Dad, it was yeah. you. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> All right. If you don't remember what that was, that was hilarious. I saw the video. Off. It's on Facebook. Anyway. All right. So, uh, uh, so easily distracted. Paul's saying, we've taken minister. We've made, we've made ministers into something that they're not. A minister is simply a servant. Someone who gives their lives for others. That's what a minister is. And ministering ought to be that. And so he says, look, I'm nobody. I'm a servant. Apollos is no one but a servant. A servant that God used to bring you to Jesus Christ. He says, I have planted the Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planted anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Man is man, God is God. Man is man, God is God. Are we God? Okay, if you're not God, then I'm definitely not God, okay? And if I'm not God, you're not God. We're man. That's it. We are never going to be more than man until God makes us something more than man. Amen? So, man is man. For us to put a man up here is idolatry. Now, you can have reverence for folks. And listen, the Bible says we should honor our elders. Uh, the Bible says to give reverence to your wife. The Bible says there are things that you are to revere and to give honor and to submit yourselves one to another. Okay? But we ought never be the one who is allowing the recipient to, to receive that honor, allow it to come into our head and make us think we are something that we are not. Whether a minister or, or, or a wife or a husband or whatever it is, humility is the key. I'll never forget, I'll never forget the day of my ordination. And as I was getting the instructions, I honestly love the men that were on my ordination council. I do, except for one. Um, I didn't like him very much. He's still around. I don't know, he's, he thinks he's all high and mighty sitting someplace. So. If you don't know how I'm talking about it, it's okay. Um, but John Horton, Pastor John Horton, he looked at me, he looked me right in my eyes, and he said, you can never go wrong with being humble. He says, don't be right, be humble. Don't be high-minded, be humble. He says, you're a servant. So serve. And serve with humility. He says, always be humble. Be humble with your wife. Be humble with your church. Be humble with your friends. Be humble. And that really stuck with me. And now, I know why God had him say that to me. Because humility is something I do not do well. Humility is not uh, uh, something that Larry... Uh, pride is something I do well. Arrogance. Uh, bravada, the exact opposite of humility. Those are things that I'm uh, very accomplished at. And so Paul's trying to let them know that man is man, God is God. Paul, Apollos, Peter, all of any, whoever it is that brought you to Christ, they're just men. Just as the people of the church were just people. Each member of Christ's body, though, has a different task. And we're going to get into those things as we get into Corinthians 
Oh man, uh, chapter 12 is amazing before we get into chapter 13. And I'm not trying to jump ahead. I'm just saying, Paul's really building up to something. <laughs> I wish, I wish, I, 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 know, I know I'm probably the only one that would like this, okay? I wish we could just take an entire day and just preach through a book. How many of you would do that for us? Now, don't raise your hand. Don't, well, you're not going to raise your hand anyway. Don't answer. Boy, that'd be fun. That'd be fun for me to just sit and preach through an entire book. So we get things in context a little bit better because you break things up over the week. It can be kind of rough to remember, you know, and who knows what we're really listening to halftime anyways, how much we're listening, how much we're dozing off, how much we're dancing through the daisies of Larryville, you know, whatever it is. I understand. Okay, I understand. So I, that would just be neat, but <coughs> I don't want to get ahead. I know what's coming. Many of you probably do. But he says, each member of Christ's body has different tasks. He says, look, I have planted a polished water. You know, I, I love Brother Randy O'Brien. How many of you remember Brother Randy O'Brien? Anybody? My wife, Brother Brent, Aaron. Well, obviously you do. Aaron, you went to church with me. Anyway, uh, uh, Brother Randy O'Brien is a member of, of Aaron's old church, uh, Pastor Mike Clyde's church. And man, I, I mean, he is just a tremendous planter. He is. He's a tremendous planter. I've been with him many times. He's taught me how to do what he does, and I just do not have what he has. You know, I'm not a planter. I'm not. Not that that negates me from planting. I ought to be sowing seeds of the gospel in the lives of those that God crosses my life with. That's what I need to be doing. But there are those that are just more proficient at it. But then there are those, let me tell you something, Brother Randy is a horrible waterer. Brother Randy cannot understand why people don't do things the way he does things in Christianity. Why they won't do it. And when he tries to help people understand what they're supposed to do, he comes across very, very tacky. Uh, uh, very abrasive. You know why? He's a planter. He's not a waterer. It's just, it's his gift. I, do, I, I consider myself much more of a waterer. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a, I like to help people know how to walk with Christ. That is my, my passion. I love that. I mean, I want, I want to lead people to, to Christ, and I've got to lead some here and there, but Brother Randy does it continually. But Brother Randy rubs the people in the church the wrong way, doesn't he? Well, you think he's hilarious. I'm not talking about his comedic act, okay? The guy is hilarious. Anyways, we all have different tasks. When we as members do our tasks, then God does what only God can do. God gives the increase. God is who... Uh, uh, brought these people into the body of Christ. It was his grace. It was his mercy. It was nothing to do with Paul. Paul was simply a tool. We're all just a bunch of tools in God's toolbox that have different designs and different uses. I have all kinds of different tools. Not, nothing like Jim. Nothing like Jim. Where's it? Which camera am I on? Nothing like Jim, okay? No one has as many tools as Jim. Jim has issues, okay? But... I have tools, and I have different tools to do different jobs, okay? Uh, I, I have an awl, but I call it a punch, okay? Um, I'm talking to Brother Fred. What? I have issues. Yeah, but not, yeah, but I'm not as bad as Jim, honey. <laughs> I do have issues, okay? Amen. All right. I got corrected, Jim. Still bad than you. All right, anyways. Um, you really distracted me. You know that? Yeah, we're all a bunch of tools. Different tools do different jobs. And we'll get, re get into that when we get to chapter 12. So he gets to verses 8 and 9. He says, He that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive of his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. What Paul's saying is, do your part. Do your part. I'm so glad that my big toe does not try and be my ear. That'd be funny, wouldn't it? They have a big toe. I didn't hear you. Hold on. I just cracked myself up, okay? I really just cracked myself up. That was funny, okay? I don't know what's wrong with you guys. That was thinking hilarious. Anyways, do your part. Do your part, okay? If you're a planter, plant seed. If you're water, pour it out. We work together to accomplish one thing, build God's building. Now, 
this is on a couple different levels. Because see, if I don't allow the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to build what's going on in here, if I don't allow it to, to build my life up, because am I or am I not the temple of the living God? Are you the temple of the living God if you're a child of God? The Bible says, be ye holy for I am holy. That don't mean that you have to clean up your house so that God can live in it. If that's the way you think, your thinking is wrong. You just let God live in it, and you follow him as he cleans it up. And don't mess it up. Let me tell you something. You wanna, I'm going to get sidetracked here. I like my house to be clean. I do. I do. I like it to be clean, and I like, I like to come into the kitchen and see things clean, countertops, dishes put away, and then I get to clean. And I clean as I, I, I go for the most part. I like, I like things to be clean. What I don't like is when everything's clean, and I go away, and I come back, and it is not clean. It causes things in me that I can't really discuss because it would make me have a bad testimony. It bothers me. And so I think about that often as I think about the fact that God is trying to clean up this filthy house. Now, he doesn't go away, but why is it that I bring in garbage and I bring in things? Why? Well, because I'm carnal. I'm fleshly. We have to work the, one, the work that God meant for us as we focus on maturing in Christ, thus making his temple, or our flesh, a holy dwelling place. Just do what he wants you to do and quit doing what you want to do. It's that simple. And we'll get more into that next week. But we work the work meant for us as God puts people into our lives to bring them into church, thus building his body. We're to build here, and we'll get more into that next week. And then we're to build, if we're building here the way we're supposed to, if we're maturing the way that we're supposed to, then this is going to be built the way that it's supposed to. When we do our part, we're rewarded, whether now or for eternity. Our work has no bearing, our work has no bearing on our status in salvation or in sanctification. I'm going to say that again. Our work, whatever your job is, water or planter, whatever it is your job as in the church, it has no bearing on your salvation or your sanctification. It's important to keep that in mind when we get into next week. Those are works of Christ that we trust and yield to. I told you I wasn't going to get all through it. I'm getting a lot further tonight, too. So You guys don't give me enough time to preach. So what do you say? We just plan it out in a couple weeks that we just come early Wednesday, stay till about midnight, and I get all the way through Corinthians. Anybody? No takers? No? Okay. All right. Let's all stand. What's that? But you love me anyway. It's like nothing in life that I've ever known. Yes, you.